How's it going, everyone? I'm Alex with Arboreal Audio, and today I wanted to do another look at Pimax using it on a full mix again. It's going to be a bit more of an in-depth look where I start from scratch on each track and show the types of settings I would use for different tracks like drums, bass, um, guitars, both clean and distorted guitars, and using it on a full mix as well. So these tracks aren't like the final take of a song or anything. Um, it's more or less sort of just a rehearsal or something. Uh, the drummer did want me to mention that he had chugged a lot of NyQuil, I guess, before recording drums, since he didn't know he would be recording drums. So if you notice any sloppy playing or anything, that's the reason why. So I'm not going to play through the whole song before we apply Pimax, just because this whole track is about five minutes long, and I don't want to waste any of your valuable time. So I'll just kind of go through track by track and show the settings. First, we can take a listen to these guitars, since they're the first thing that starts off the song. Um, there's two sort of clean guitars to start off, um, one of which is a real, actual, living, breathing tube amplifier, and one of them is a plug-in. I'm curious if anyone can tell the difference. So with this guitar on the left here, I've just got um, an instance of, you know, an LA-2A style compressor on it on both these guitars, left and right. Just really like the way that, you know, opto compressors sound on uh, clean guitars especially. But let's take a look at just one of these guitars and add Pimax to it. Guitars, I definitely like to go for the asymmetric saturation, uh, just adds a lot more warmth. And I'm probably also going to lean on the positive mode here. Just adds even more additional juiciness, which I really like on clean guitars. And you can even start kind of driving it a little more. That doesn't sound, you know, destroyed. We're not, uh, you know, completely frying the guitars here or anything. But it is kind of limiting those peaks by quite a bit. And then one interesting thing we can do here is actually kind of EQ the guitars if we want to open up the band split mode. By default, you get three bands. You could go down to just two. You could you have a maximum of four different bands. Um, in this case, I think I mainly just want to add a bit more saturation to the low end of the guitars. If you go too far, you can kind of end up sucking out some of the energy of the low end. You can solo it to get a better idea of what you're doing. And even that is not particularly extreme. Now, I suppose the guitars going in are a little bit quieter, but... This is a decent amount of drive that we're applying to the bottom end of the guitars here, or, you know, low mids and bottom end. So I'm actually gonna just add some extra saturation to the low end, and then I'm gonna try out doing a just an output boost to the top end and see if that adds any extra brilliance or if it's maybe too much. These are already pretty bright guitars to begin with. But in the context of a full mix, we might actually want that. And let's unsolo it and uh, see how it sounds in context of a full mix. Let's uh, skip ahead to where there's drums and bass. So I'm thinking 
just a bit of the boost to that sort of top half of the frequency spectrum is all that's really needed there, but it definitely adds, it definitely aids in the audibility of the guitars. And the last thing I want to do, and this is something I love to do on mono guitars, which both of these are, is using a special feature of the width knob, where if you alt click it, you can turn a mono signal into a stereo signal. Context of a full mix, you can even hear how it's just getting so much wider. Something around right around there is kind of what I would ideally go for. And then we can bypass it and see what the difference is between what we're actually adding. In this case, I, I quite like how it sounds. The low end kind of gets smeared out a little bit because of that stereo width that we're doing. And sometimes leaving guitars in mono is for the best. In this case, I do like the extra sort of space that this adds. Now I'm gonna go ahead and basically duplicate the plugin on the other clean guitar. And it'll probably still require some adjustments from there. So we can take a listen to that, how that sounds. Probably gonna leave this all the way up just because I really like the way that sounds. And adding that top end is definitely helping. You could probably get away with a little more. The guitars on the left are pretty bright. Let's actually listen to both of them. start to hear some of that saturation getting, you know, pretty colorful uh, on that part. Let's listen to just this guitar. That actually sounds pretty good. I'd probably back it off a little bit. Yeah, I think that sounds really good. And of course, the extra width definitely helps. All right. So I think that'll do it for the clean guitars. Now I want to move on to the bass. So in this instance, the bass is going through a plugin. I didn't have any bass amps. I mean, the band didn't have any bass amps lying around. So um, they just had to settle for Guitar Rig 6. So let's take a look at the settings for that. You can see there's a tube compressor before the amp um, and then another opto compressor. All right, so let's take a listen to the bass. With bass, I definitely like the asymmetric mode as well. Might even try the clip mode. The infinite mode can kind of add uh, an interesting sort of warbly pitch effect. Um, you'll notice bass quack preset uh, makes use of that for some interesting special effects. I've also got the bass fattener preset here. And this is a really good starting point for bass. Let's just enable the auto gain so we don't uh, destroy your eardrums. Not a huge difference, but there's definitely one there. One thing I'm noticing here, I'm feeling like the super lows are kind of leaning towards the right side of the stereo spectrum just a little bit. So one thing you can do here is actually jump into multiband mode and we can actually use the stereo widener to narrow the super low frequencies, make them a little more mono, a little more focused in the center. <laughs> Oh. 
I'm gonna cut that out, right? So let's take a listen to how that sounds. solo it. I'm feeling like fully mono is a little overkill. Right around there sounds pretty good to me. Then we can even play around with some extra saturation in this end. That, that's kind of excessive. Don't want to totally destroy this part. We still want some of the transients of the bass to kind of have their impact. Maybe just a little bit. Then we can play around with the top end of the bass as well. I'm gonna skip ahead to this part in the song because uh, I thought this bass line is pretty cool. drums there but anyway we're gonna have to listen to them on their own uh, since we are mixing it oh no the song sounds better in the reverse i hope no one notices okay so let's take a listen to the snare track i'm using uh tokyodon's nova plugin as sort of an expander um it's like the only decent expander I have. Um, I've got an instance of snare buzz because the snare was just mic'd from the top. You know, this isn't the most hi-fi expensive polish recording. I'm not saying I recorded this. this. These were just the tracks provided to me by the band, remember. But anyway, this is what we have to work with. I'm not complaining. And of course, a little bit of compression here with FabFilter Pro C. Let's just take a listen to what it sounds like before So when you're using Pimax on a snare, there's kind of two different things you can do, and they're both kind of interesting, uh, mainly revolving around this curve setting. So if we go more towards the right, you'll hear that it gets like super huge and fat. And if we go more towards the left, it acts almost as like an expander or a noise gate or something where it is actually reducing the volume of those elements of the signal that are quieter than the big transients. And in this case, that's probably what we're looking for because as I mentioned, you know, not the highest budgeted best recording ever done. There's a lot of hi-hat bleed in the snare mics. So I'm going to go ahead and play like the loudest part of the song, just so we can get an idea for how the snare is going to respond to these settings. Let's have a look. So that's pretty interesting. For this song, I don't think a super fat snare is um, what we necessarily want. The drum sound isn't really like huge and pummeling. Um, it's more just kind of natural sounding. And so in this case, I think leaning towards the negative mode and suppressing just some of that bleed is actually gonna be pretty ideal. I tend to wanna use the clip mode for drums because it preserves the transient energy a bit better than finite or infinite. The reason being that when you start to drive it up and the loudest parts of the signal are hitting that sort of clipping threshold, the louder they get, they actually start to dip down. And that's what this transfer curve is illustrating. But in clip mode, they go up and hit that threshold and they stay there. That preserves a lot of the punch of the transients. Even though you're clipping them, it'll sound more impactful than finite or infinite will.
So that's really nice. So I think it you can hear that it's suppressing the hi-hats a little bit, but we're not really losing a lot of attack on the snare. All right, now let's have a look at the kick. The effects chain is pretty similar. Um, Nova again for an expander and then Pro-C as a compressor. So you could kind of take the same approach here as we did with the snare where you can try and suppress some of that bleed through. And this actually behaves differently if you're in symmetric or asymmetric mode. You don't get quite that same level of sort of dropouts. However, that sounds really good on the kick. And since this isn't like the punchiest, most hard hitting kick, I think getting a bit of extra weight out of it is kind of the way to go. Okay, so room mics are uh, up next. I have a bus compressor on these. Um, it's hitting them pretty hard. Now with the room mics, I definitely want to hit Pimax a little harder. And so I actually have this volume adjustment in there, just doing an extra 12 dB of boost into the plugin. Because I do really like the sound of just crushed, smashed room mics. So let's hear how that sounds. Mm-hmm, nice and juicy. And of course, definitely gonna want this. Yeah. So much less polite. Now that's a little extreme. I think right around there sounds quite good. And then another interesting thing we do here, since we're dealing with wider array of frequencies, given that they're drum room mics, uh, the band split mode could have an interesting effect where we can kind of EQ the signal a little bit or drive certain frequencies a little more. Let's play around with it. One thing I sometimes like to do on room mics is dampen the high end a little more because that can create the illusion that the mics are actually further away from the sound source uh, than they actually are. Because um, the further away you are from the sound source, the less high frequency content is going to arrive. And that sounds a little too damp. there sounds pretty good. Ah, uh, yeah, you can, you know, totally trash it and make it sound lo-fi if you really want to. I don't want to completely crush that part. I mean, I think it sounds pretty good as is. Last thing I'll probably do on these rooms, though, let's just skip to another part of the song. The beat's not too complex. I mean, like I said, you know, like, well, but. Last thing I kind of want to do here is actually narrow the low end a little bit, just so that it's a little more focused and a little more in line with the kick and snare close mics, which are, you know, mono in the center. Doesn't have to be too drastic. Let's hear it with the full thing. Then we got the overheads. These aren't too crazy. Um, I've got a 1176 style compressor on that. And I like a compression on the overheads that makes them pretty snappy. And as far as Pimax, nothing too crazy here.
last thing in the drum bus is just a snare reverb. The reverb itself is so quiet that it's not really getting saturated. Um, you could overdrive it if you want and get, you know, kind of a crazy sort of lo-fi sort of crunchy reverb sound. In this case, I want it to be a little cleaner, but we can hear how that sounds. And then the last tracks to go over in the song are just the distorted guitars. Um, these are both real live tube amplifiers. Just to save a little time, I'll show you the settings I already had set up with it. Um, asymmetric mode, you know, full positive curve, and then some mono to stereo width, since these are mono guitars. So we can take a listen to how the guitars sound with and without Pimax. Um, here's with Pimax on both. <laughs> adding a lot of extra grit and some extra space as well and you know maybe you think that's uh, too much saturation for these kind of sort of crunchy not too distorted guitars I really like that extra layer of saturation it almost is sort of like uh, what you get from a microphone preamplifier or something now of course we have to talk about the mix bus again I've got another bus compressor on it same one I was using on those other drum tracks I just love the way this thing sounds it's kind of you know your SSL style bus compressor and as far as Pimax goes this is kind of the use case I made Pimax for um, it just sounds really great on a full mix you can get a lot of extra volume and loudness without destroying your mix and destroying your transients you can really give your limiter a break if you're shooting for a certain LUFS target, for instance. And so my mix bus settings are basically the default Pimax settings. Um, I did have enabled auto gain. And let's take a listen. So you could start to hear some of the, you know, oversaturation starting to creep in, but even there, we're getting away with 12 dB of gain and not destroying the sound. We can enable the delta mode and actually hear what it is we're doing in the mix. And that's a healthy amount of distortion and saturation. So I would probably back that off. Around there sounds pretty good to me. And now I'm not saying that you should calibrate your settings based on how the delta sounds. You should really just do it on how it sounds, plain and simple. And the last thing I really like to do on the mix bus is add a little extra width. <laughs> I just love the way it sounds on a mix bus. Everything gets so much thicker, but it doesn't sound destroyed. If there's one thing you're gonna use Pimax for, I definitely think a mix bus is a great place for it. So one thing that's really worth looking at is how a limiter responds with and without Pimax at various points in the signal chain. So we'll look at how it sounds um, with and without Pimax on the mix bus. And then we'll look at how it sounds when Pimax is bypassed globally and you can see both how it sounds and how the limiter is reacting.
So as you can hear, that's a pretty big difference. Um, the guitars got a lot more aggressive, a lot wider. The dynamics of the drums change a lot. And as you can see from the limiter, the dynamics of the drums are a lot more contained by the instances of Pimax that are on it. And it's able to do that without making the transients of the drum sound destroyed and without some of the potentially destructive artifacts of dynamic controllers like compressors or limiters. All right, well, that's going to do it for this one. I hope you enjoyed watching. Um, hope you didn't get headphone head as bad as I do. I know I get it really bad. I hope you enjoyed seeing what Pimax can do on a full mix. I will be posting this song on the Arboreal Audio website for anyone who's interested. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.